I tried to uh, do the two's complement negation. Okay. NEG. So you found the NEG, but what sort of C code did you use to find it? Uh, my C code was uh, just in A equals two, in B equals negative A, and then it's Okay, so you just did that? All right. So he found two's complement negation. We talked about one's complement yesterday, the not instruction, right? That'll flip all the bits on something, and that's kind of one's complement. And so two's complement, or just taking something and making it negative, is the neg instruction. So two's complement. Does I spell it? Is that how you spell it? Is it complement? -E. Complement. AKA making stuff negative. All right. And then uh, you said we could find the multiply in Visual C++? Yes. I didn't know if you counted because I looked it up. But uh, okay. if you cast it to unsigned long, long, and using unsigned in. So oh, that's unfortunate. Brad, he, I called on him before you. Yes, Brad uh, emailed me last night as well saying he also looked it up. And did you find the Stack Overflow? Of course. Exactly. So, all right. So there's a Stack Overflow uh, article out there where someone is saying exactly why won't Visual Studio make a mall instruction for me? And uh, what the people said was, put it up here. What the people said was, um, basically, they use iMall because, um, well, I think the gist of it was they use iMall because. Um, in C, if you have an int times an int, uh, by default, the result is considered to be an int. And therefore, even if you overflow it, it really just truncates it back down to that 32 and whatever is on top gets thrown away. Just that's the C thing. And so uh, basically, it doesn't matter. And then the other thing is when you have these things which potentially overflow, it doesn't matter whether it's signed or unsigned as far as the lower 32 bits are concerned. So the upper bits will differ but the lower ones won't, and therefore iMall versus mall are equivalent. And, uh, and so what the article also said is if you go to long longs, so if you go to 64-bit values and you try to do a multiply, then it'll put this, the result into a 64-bit value, and therefore the, the negative or positive will start mattering at the top. And so uh, then if you do that, you'll get a uh, mall instruction. And I, I have uh, the simple source sample code that I think was the equivalent of the Stack Overflow stuff that Brad sent me. So I'll show you that in a second as well. But yes, you get extra credit too, kind of. Everyone who got it uh, by looking up, I give you half point extra credit because you looked it up. All right, so that is unsigned multiply. All right, anything else? Nope. All right. Um, that was pretty lame. Nice did a decrement. Um, okay. <laughs> Got a deck. And what uh, instruction sequence did you use in C to get that? Um, just uh, minus minus there in a loop. All right. The biggest problem was just trying to get. Uh, I originally was using the Xcode, and uh, I forgot to compile it for 32 instead of 64. So ah, okay. Of gotcha. Stuff. So he was using Mac, and he compiled it 64. Actually, <clears> Dave <throat> also generated some 64-bit assembly, which we'll see in a second as well. So decrement a register. I think it only works on a register. I may be incorrect. You may be able to specify an R32, but I think it's only a register. So, you know, that's subtract one. All right, Amy? Um, I did not actually write the program, but I looked up in the book and thought that we didn't do any strings yesterday. So mm -hmm. there were probably instructions related to strings. The book says that you can move entire words. No, um, no, no. We're about to talk about that example next. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, yep. so, so that's an example. There, there's definitely um, some string, some repeated string operations. There's a single string operation instructions, and then there's special repeat forms where you do it over and over again. And we're going to cover those uh, in a second. Amy, fail. Okay. Katie? That's So 2x decrement, 2x small. And actually, Dave also had negation, I believe. Yeah. Right? And yeah, I'll pull yours up in a second, because he found a very interesting thing that like, I have no idea why the compiler generated it. But you know, I will ask the
studio audience and or the internet's audience to explain it to me later. But all right. That's, a leave. That's right. You did find a leave, but we're going to cover leave uh, in two examples from now. But leave equals uh, which direction? E S P E B P. No. S P. <clears throat> so we'll see this in just a second, this leave instruction, but it's actually the equivalent of those two sort of teardown instructions that we see at the end of code where you move to get rid of all your local variables and then you pop the stack frame. All right. Andrew? Um, well, I saw two. But I guess the simpler one was uh, branch if not equal using an if else. Okay, so wait, branch if not equal. BNE? So it was an actual BNE. Yeah. BNE. And yeah, so that's. We have branch if not equal in Intel? Yeah? Hmm. I, I feel like there was like conditional moves and stuff like that, but uh, I didn't remember there was that. One second. Do Let's see how that differs from a jump if not equal, for instance. I'm not seeing B and E. Uh, does it matter that I did it on my older Mac? Yes. <laughs> Was it a Power Motorola. PC? <laughs> that would be Motorola then. Yes, I, I think so. Uh, so then I no? guessed it. Yeah, so you were probably disassembling like Power PC or something like that. Was it like a G4, G5 or it's, something? Yeah. G5? Yes, yeah, G5. Yep. All right, well, Andrew found some uh, Power failed. PC assembly, which we Definitely don't so have. I guess that PEA was also Motorola. The what? PEA. Yeah. So so that's why see I, that's why it's so suspicious. All of a sudden you said BNE and I was like, wait, you remember my example for Realms from 1996 where I said I was you know <laughs> modifying some uh, some instruction sequence on an old Mac? Yeah, that sounded very not right. Okay, well, Ariel. Uh, yes. What did you find last time? Uh, several. Um, the most interesting of which was, uh, oddly not on this sheet because I apparently printed out the wrong version. I want to say M O V S W L. M O V S W. Yeah, so this is. Well, I think this is move. Well, yeah, okay, I'm not sure. I'm going to look that up quick. I would think this is move with sign extension, and the thing is, you probably did it on. Uh, on um, Linux, right? Yes. Yeah. So the thing is, with with Linux, sometimes like that W on there, that's not actually part of the uh, mnemonic. That's something like Linux will add on like lengths in order to say like this instruction is moving a word, or this instruction is moving along. I found a whole bunch that were move L's. And exactly. And add L's and compare so L's. All the so move L's. Probably don't count. Yeah, those are all just moves and adds and stuff. And and uh, in AT and T syntax, you can tack on a little thing that says like. So I have, I've been leaving it off of all of our examples uh, thus far. And um, oh, I forgot to ever turn that on. I've been leaving it off of our examples thus far, but in AT and T or Intel syntax, for instance, uh, we'll often it'll say like move double word pointer, but I've been like leaving the double word pointer off thus far. So let's do something like. All right, when this comes up. Yep. All right, so I've kind of been eliding this fact on our uh, Intel syntax thus far, but if you look at our move instructions here, we have move and it says D word pointer 
and then the stuff inside the angle brackets which we were talking about yesterday. And the D word pointer is what's telling us actually what the size is. Right? And so in that case for, uh, for Linux it's trying to say, you know, move, probably that's a move S like sine extend, I think. Uh, no, no, be move. short because that was in fact what I changed that, that got it that. Right. And the thing is on Linux, again, their word sizes, like GDB's word sizes don't uh, correspond to Intel's word sizes. Like a 32-bit is a word in GDB and, uh, you know, 16 bits is a word for Intel. So, but let me see here quick, because actually that's probably, it was just move SW, right? Um, okay. I printed out the wrong one, so I'll have to look it up again. Yeah. Um, I think that's actually areas. a form, that's like a single form of Something we're going to learn about in two examples again. It's like the non-repeated form of a move string. Yeah, move string was what I've been hoping for, but I got very confused as to why I got it. Because all I'm doing is dealing with uh, printf and, and an integer increment. Right. Yeah, so... I believe it's this, this move s instruction, and then it's really just a question of what size it is. It's probably this one, and we'll go into that a little later. But this is sort of like what Amy was talking about. There's these uh, string instructions, and there's single forms of them, but then there's also repeated forms, which is what we're going to be covering in a little bit. All right, anyways, uh, anything else other than variants on stuff with uh, things tacked on to the end of the mnemonic? No? All right. Question? Is there an actual loop or, or an actual conditional assembly instruction? What do you mean conditional? So there were there was one conditional jump within that loop. So there was the jump greater than or equal to, which was the comparison if I is greater than or equal to Yeah, 10. but then you had to repeat the jump instruction in every case. Is there yes. some kind of loop assembly oh, instruction? Yes, if you're asking if there's like a specific assembly instruction that'll just loop, yeah. there, there's kind of two forms. One, there is like literally one called loop, and I have never seen that actually used in practice. And then two, um, there is there's this looping sort of string operation where you're doing the same thing over and over, but that's not the same thing where you can do complex logic in between things. So with these repeated string so loops and stuff, to... if you just want to copy some data, you can loop and repeat that over and over, and that's what we'll see in two examples. Uh, but there is also an actual loop instruction. So I've never really went and looked at the details of that since I've never actually seen it, but I'll bring it up a little bit later. So yes. a question about homework, which is that I tried for about an hour to get my compiler to output in ink yep. or a deck. Yep. And I would reliably get it to either add or subtract one. Yep. And so actually, so uh, Greg on the phone had um, that he found a uh, ink actually. Maybe you should check the box. Hmm? All right, so Greg said he found an ink when he turned on optimizations, for instance, on uh, Visual Studio. And I was actually surprised by that because according to the Intel uh, optimization guidelines, it says, you know, please do not use the ink instruction because of some flag setting that doesn't happen the same way whether you do an add one versus an ink. So I don't think I have like the optimization manuals added in with the rest of the manuals. So I can't just show that. But uh, I'll put that down as another thing to bring up at the at the uh, break. Uh, show how the what the Intel manuals say about ink. I don't know if they say the same thing about deck, but they probably do. All right. All right. So let's go to the phones. All right. So uh, Greg, did you wait? Was it Greg who found that? Who found the ink on the phone? I can't remember. Yeah, that was me. Okay. Sorry. And did you find any other instructions? No, I didn't. Okay. All right. So, so Greg found an ink when he turned on. Okay. Well, hold on a second. This is. Oh, we don't 
care about the W here. The move S instruction is uh, move string, kind of like move string, but what it really does is it uh, it does move, and we'll say that it's going to be a D word size. So move a uh, D word from uh, PSI, the source. So actually, you know, whatever memory is pointed to by ESI to EDI destination. So it moves just a single D word. And then uh, Greg found an ink, which is I'm actually going to look that up quick to see whether or not that um, ink or deck can work on memory, or if it's just uh, it's just a register. Oh yeah, there we go. So ink has an RM32 form. So. Ink or deck can both work on a register or memory. All right. Brad, let's see. You found the mall instruction. Was uh, that the only thing? Well, I realized based on the conversation you just had about looping that the other thing I found was the rep STOS, and you're going to get to that in a little bit, yep. but that was the other part All of right. the program that I found. So he found rep STOS. We're going to talk about that in the next instruction, uh, next example. All right, uh, Grant, what did you find? And Bill, can you turn up the uh, speakers, by the way? Sure. Grant, uh, what did you find? I don't see him pushing his microphone, so I'm not quite sure if he's All right. available. John, what did you find? Uh, I've actually found three. Okay. Uh, repeat not equal clear directional flag, and then jumps if not zero. I wasn't sure if the repeat and the jumps counted. Okay, hold on a second. So you found rep not equal. What, what's that exact mnemonic? Right. Uh, rep okay. any. And then clear directional flag. Yep. And then J and Z. Okay. Yeah, J and Z, like we talked about yesterday, is the Z is the same thing as an E. So jump not equal, jump not zero, same thing. So this is a variant on those conditional things that we saw yesterday. A clear directional flag, I put that? No. Uh, that was another one that, um, <coughs> that Dave found. And in his code, I had no idea. What did you do to get the clear directional flag? What sort of C code? So this was a uh, code looking to identify the VGA driver to see if you could identify the manufacturer of your okay. video card. And it came at the end of a process. Sure. Well, then, you know, did that come, for instance, like before the rep not e, rep any? Or did it come after or anything like that? Was it like directly proximate to the rep instruction? Because that would at least make sense, unlike uh, Dave's example. Do you recall if that was proximate or not? Well, I just, I just went back to look at okay. the code. There's a uh, process that starts off, and it was the very last command in the process to close out the process. Really? Interesting. That doesn't really make much sense either. I mean, I can email you the source yeah, if you want. Yeah, please do. All right. Uh, Justin, what did you find? I was able to find the negate NEG instruction. Was that the only one? Okay. Yeah, that's so all. We can see three negates, you know, decrements, one increment. So maybe these are additional things you might want to at least be aware of, right? They're not particularly complicated, easy to learn, right? 
uh, negate. Sorry, we're not done yet. I know, Nathan, I'll come back to you, but just as a comment, because, you know, we're already to 3x of something now. Uh, so like I said, three, 3 negates. Negate, very simple. It just says take a positive number, make it negative. You know, two decrements. Decrement and increment are just, you know, take a register or a memory value and add one or subtract one from it. And then we've got some rep type instructions down there. See more later. Uh, all right, Nathan? Uh, I also found the rep and STOS instruction. So just the, so rep STOS is actually considered like one instruction. So just that one instruction? Just that one instruction? Uh, yeah, I was under the impression it was two, so I guess I learned something. Yeah, so it, it's, uh, it is kind of one instruction, or you can think of it like a modified form of just the STOS instruction with a prefix. The rep is actually kind of a prefix, so that's fine. It, it's a prefix which only works with specific uh, instructions that end with that S, that move S, rep S, the NE, I guess, but that's the exception. Uh, and then, let's see, below Nathan, I think maybe Jeff is going to be there. Jeff, what did you find? No, we don't have Jeff online today. So, Victor, what did you find? I guess you can add me the list of egg eight functions. That's the only one. All I'm right, so you found an egg as well. All right. So, 4x, everyone go out and learn how to turn positive numbers into negative numbers. All right. So, let's see. Just to go down these again, like I said, neg, positive and negative. Mul unsigned multiply, you, it seems you can get this when you go ahead and use 64-bit values. Then it'll start generating that, and I'll actually show some code. It doesn't generate it directly, at least on Visual Studio. It seems to make you call a little multiply function which uses it. Decrement, decrements a single register or uh, memory location. Leave, we'll see in a little bit here. It's basically just the equivalent of these two instructions, move EBP to ESP, which gets rid of all your local variables, and then pop EBP. Uh, move S, this is move a string, which, which in this case, without a rep in front of it, does EDI to ESI. Increment, just add one to memory or register. Repstos, we'll see in a second. This is repeat store to string. Or store, to, yeah, I think store to string. Rep NE, that's fairly uncommon, actually. Well, I don't know if it's uncommon, just I, I don't see this very frequently. So I have to probably look that up to, to make sure I'm describing it right. Clear directional flag, so amongst those many flags, which I said you don't need to know about. Uh, there is one called the directional flag, and this one's kind of interesting. And because two people found it, I'll get into this today in the context of this rep stos and rep move, which we'll learn about in a second. And then jump not zero, aka jump not equal, things like that. So I want to quickly bring up um, bring up the mall example code that uh, that Brad sent me. All right, so in my scratch pad, I copied over what he sent me. All right, so you can see here I have unsigned long long. These are 64-bit values. And so he's just setting something equal to A, setting something equal to B, and having a equivalently sized thing that he's going to store them both into. So A times B equals C. So we're going to set a breakpoint on that. And we're going to set scratch pad to be the thing we're debugging. Start it up. All right, go to the disassembly. All right, and the first thing we see is standard uh, function prolog. Then we see subtract hex 18 from ESP. That's three times these 64-bit uh, values, or, or three times eight things. I think that's right, yep. So three times eight is uh, one eight, 16 plus eight. All right, so that's allocating space for the A, B, and C. And then what it does is it takes hex 32, which is 50, and uh, puts it into EBP. Wait. Yeah, okay. So hex 32, which is 50, puts it into EBP minus A. 
which is the lower 32 bits of, uh, of A, and then it puts zero into the upper 32 bits. Right? Again, hex 46, which is 70 into the lower 32 bits, zero into the upper 32 bits. And then finally, what it does is it's basically going to get those values into EAX, ECX, EDX, and then it's going to be pushing each of these onto the stack. So that basically it's generating this call instruction. It's not going to like just do the mull instruction straight up. And I don't know why, but uh, and actually, interestingly, this one's not telling me the name of this thing. Uh, when I was doing it on my own machine, it told me that it was like underscore all mull or something like that, like underscore A L L M U L. So, anyways, I guess this is a little maybe maybe it's because I I don't know why that is. But anyways, turns out that Visual Studio doesn't just do the straight up mall. It pushes these two values that it wants to multiply to some generic multiply function. So we'd pushed, you know, all of the stuff. And when I come down here and I step into this, it's going to say, where's this, you know, assembly for this? Maybe it was LL mall and not all mall. I may be misremembering. So it's saying, you know, where's your source code? You're going to jump into some function that's not your function. Where's the source code? I say, I don't know. All right, so I step in here. And the main thing we want to see just is that, you know, eventually it gets to a mall. So either right here or right there. You know, so there's this jump not equal here. It's going to do some comparison, jump not equal. It's either going to skip this first mall and go down to the second one, or it's going to do the first one. So got this little function in here, which has a variety of different, uh, Malls it can hit under different conditions, which I haven't analyzed, but uh, but the point is we eventually do get this unsigned mall when we're working with these long longs. All right, and then I wanted to bring up uh, Dave's example code. Where did I put that? All right, so. He did this sort of function. He had, you know, he used the absolute value function and he put the absolute values A and B into these things and then he had C and then he took C equals A mod B, right? So remember the percent sign is mod in, uh, in C, which says, you know, I want only to keep the remainder, right? So I'm basically doing a division and then I only want the remainder of uh, the result, basically. So he did A mod B and then just returned that uh, C. And I guess he called Bob uh, using values from his main, the zero, and uh, well, using uh, four and nine, passed those in and then did absolute value of four and nine and put that in there and then did four mod nine. I believe that's correct, right? So four, oh, nine, four, nine. Yep, I did four mod nine. All right, and then he uh, he did GCC just to compile this. And then he used objdump in order to dump it out, but he obviously did this on, you know, some 64-bit system, so we get nice 64-bit uh, values and things like that. But, you know, he was nice enough to put little arrows here where he said, here's our new things, right? And so this is just a 64-bit negate. Uh, it's got that L on it because, like I said, when we get to the AT&T syntax, they like to put, you know, things just specifiers for length directly onto the mnemonic. So we found a negate instruction. Wait, you said this was clear the directional flag, but is that true? TLTD? I need to check that quick. Uh, make sure there's nothing that has a T in it. See, this is literally 99. It's not that. Simultaneously, this one is FC. Uh, 
I don't know if that's to clear the direction flag unless it's like That's not 99, and that's not 99. So this is interesting. In this case, like, so I have some ambiguity here where I'm trying to say, well, normally when I would expect to see the clear direction flag, it would just be CLD, right? But this is CLTD, and so I say, okay, is this just the Intel syntax or the AT&T syntax using a different, like, mnemonic is, you know, so each disassembler gets to choose what mnemonic it wants to use to describe instructions, right? And so then there's the sequence of bytes, which I said, you know, thus far I've just been hiding from you. And I, I've talked about immediates are like hard coded into instructions, but, you know, we haven't really seen it. Uh, this is an example. This is an immediate of a zero hard coded into an instruction. Uh, but so I can use these bytes to then go back, you know, so if I'm a disassembler, I use this byte sequence to say what instruction is what, basically. So the thing here is I see 99. And uh, that's not corresponding to this byte sequence, and that's not corresponding to that byte sequence. So I'm going to, uh, at the break, I'm going to go and dig into this one. And there's a little table at the very end, which you can use to reverse look up from bytes to instructions and stuff like that. But I don't want to get into that at the moment. So where is my note sheet? <clears throat> yep. Hey, Zeno, this is Brad. I saw something on a line that said uh, convert signed long to signed double long. Converts. So when you looked up the CLTD or whatever? Convert signed yeah. long to convert to uh, double long is what you said? Yeah, I don't know if that makes sense in this case or not, but it was an explanation. Well, it probably does make more sense than it just clearing the direction flag here, but... Um, all right, well, I'm going to check that still at the break. So, but, you know, since uh, someone else did find the, the clear direction flag, I'll just say here that that's what the CLD does. It, there's this D flag in, uh, in uh, the E flags register, and you can either set or clear it specifically with these instructions. So the previous flags we were talking about, uh, they were all things which get set automatically through instructions. This is something where you can flip a flag one way or the other because this direction flag actually controls the way that certain operations occur. It'll say if direction flag is set, uh, if it's set to zero, then uh, these next instructions we're going to see go from low to high, and if it's set to one, instructions go high to low. So we'll get into that again when we cover these next examples. All right. So going back. All right. So. This is where we left off yesterday. We were going to uh, get into example eight. All right. So here's a very simple example in uh, which turns out to be fairly complex if we don't turn off those uh, various sanity checks and things like that in the debug build of Visual Studio. So we are just going to allocate enough space for a buffer which is 40 bytes long. <coughs> Then we're going to take the number 42 and we're going to move it into the last entry of the buffer. <coughs> and then there will be hex blood. So if we compile this, we get this. And so we want to dig into this and figure out uh, what the deal is with this. But first, we, we have a new instruction, the rep stos or repeat store to string. <coughs> so we need to talk about that. All right. So uh, as was, you know, as was said before, um, there are there are certain uh, family of string uh, instructions for which you can use rep as a prefix, basically, and it's saying repeat this instruction over and over. So there is just a plain store to string, and I can't remember. Did someone find that? No. So Ariel found move s, which is a version of this that we'll see in the next example, but. Um, but so there is a standalone STOS instruction, store to string. Um, but we're primarily, we usually see these sort of instructions in their repeat form, where they have rep before them and then uh, store to string. So for the, for the rep instructions, what they are is they're functionally a single, they're looping and doing the store to string operation multiple times over and over again. Uh, under certain conditions. So the primary condition is that now we finally are going to see ECX being used for that register convention that we talked about at the beginning. 
So we said ECX can act like a counter for something, and this is where it acts as a counter. So with the RepStos instruction, you would initialize ECX to the number of times that you want to uh, perform the STOS action, and then uh, when, you, when you execute the RepStos, it just keeps going and it decrements ECX one time for each time it does the STOS action. So uh, specifically, what the STOS action does is it will either fill, you know, one byte pointed to by EDI with whatever value is in AX. Right, so remember, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Can't be a byte if it's AX. AX is 16 bits. Like I said, I love finding bugs every time I go through this. All right. One minute. Yeah, so it can either be, technically, I guess there's, you can move one byte at a time or one D word at a time. Technically, there's a 16-bit form, but we're going to pretend there's not. So we're going to say it's either moving one byte or one D word at a time, but you have to do something special to get the 16-bit version anyways, so we're going to ignore that for the moment. All right, so let's try AL. If you're going to be using your printed slides, fix that. All right. So you can take one byte from AL, which is that lowest byte of the EAX register, right? And we're going to put that into memory wherever EDI is pointing right now. So, so that's uh, the core version of STOS is either take one byte from AL, stick it into memory at EDI, or take four bytes from EAX and stick it into memory at wherever EDI points to. And when it does that, <coughs> Automatic, <clears throat> so automatic within this uh, rep construct is the fact that after it moves this one byte or four bytes from EAX into EDI, we'll just talk about the four byte version from now on. <clears throat> it moves four bytes into memory pointed to by EDI. It decrements ECX by one and then it increments EDI by four. So it's sort of like you have some pointer to EDI, you copy four bytes there, and then you move EDI up, and you decrement ECX. So it's saying the ECX is the counter, so it's like I did it one time, so I must decrement ECX by one. And then EDI is your destination, and EDI just keeps moving up. <coughs> EDI, hold on a sec. So EDI is basically like this pointer which keeps getting incremented each time through the loop. ECX is your loop counter. It keeps getting decremented each time through the loop. And basically this instruction stops doing the same thing over and over once ECX gets to zero. So when ECX, the counter, finally hits zero, you move past this RepStos instruction to the next instruction. But as long as ECX is greater than zero, it just keeps moving, you know, four bytes from EAX to EDI and then increments EDI, then moves four bytes, then increments it, then moves four bytes, then increments it. So basically, over and over, this is a thing. So what you can think of this here, like in C notion, is like a one instruction um, mem set, right? That's the word I'm thinking of, mem set, right? So you have the mem set uh, instruction, which says, I want, you know, when you call the C function mem set, you give it a pointer to where to start, you give it a value that you want to set all this memory to, zero, cc, whatever, and then you say, here's the size that I want to set, right? So this is basically a one, one byte, uh, sorry, one instruction version of that. You give it an EDI where you want to start. You give it a count. <coughs> ECX is the count of the number of times you're going to set something, and then whatever you put into EAX, that's what it's going to just keep writing to memory over and over and incrementing as you go along. 
So basically, you know, I call it a one, one instruction version of our mem set, but really there's a little bit of setup that has to go on before it, right? So one, you got to set ECX to however many times you want to copy this value. Two, you got to set EAX to whatever you want to write to memory. And uh, how did I say there's three? Set EDI, set EAX. Right, so set the destination, set the EAX value, and set uh, ECX to the number of times to copy, right? So I think I actually said three and I didn't count to three. Yep. So set your destination, set your value to copy, and then set the size to copy, which is really just ECX, which is the number of times you want to do it. And so the size is really just however many times you want to do it divided by whatever size you're writing. So you could be writing one byte at a time, in which case you'd set ECX to um, the total size, right? Or if you're, if you're doing it four bytes at a time, then you kind of have the size needs to be divided by four because it's going to write four bytes. So it's not going to decrement ECX by four e when you write four bytes. It's going to decrement ECX by one. So it says, I wrote four bytes, decrement ECX by one. So ECX is always decremented by one. But EDI is incremented by either one or four, depending on what form you're using at the moment. So, you know, I said, we'll pretend there's only two forms. There's actually a 16-bit form as well. But you can just think of it like there's one form where you're, the instruction you're actually doing it says, you know, I'm only copying one byte at a time. And the other form says four bytes at a time. So anyways. Let's, uh, let's see that in the context of this previous thing. I guess I have all the description here. Well, so I guess here I just say that within that assembly that we saw, here's where it's doing each of the things um, that you need to do to st set up a rep stops, right? So we set the destination EDI, so we have some value, whatever it is, we move it into EDI, right, using an LEA. We move hex uh, 3C into EAX and set the count. And then we move some value into EAX. Sorry, that was ECX. Move some value into EAX in order to set the value that I want to write to memory. In this case, they chose to set all the memory to hex C. And then finally, we execute the rep stops. So we're going to go look at that in the context of what's actually happening here and try to understand, like, OK, you know, this was our assembly code or our C code. And why do we get uh, what we get here? And I'm going to draw sort of a. Uh, stack frame picture for this. <coughs> hey, Zeno, is there um, any reason why they chose C? Yes, particular? so there is a reason why they chose C, and I'll talk about that. Uh, well, I'll talk about it now. Um, they chose C because um, in the, the single byte CC, that corresponds to the interrupt 3 instruction. So if you go to interrupts, CC is interrupt 3. Uh, interrupt 3 is the breakpoint interrupt, actually. So when we click and set breakpoints, uh, that's the, it's really the, the debugger is sticking in a little CC right there so that when the instruction gets hit, it fires off an interrupt. The debugger catches the interrupt and says, aha, I hit a debug breakpoint. I need to stop stuff. I need to update, whatever. So we talk about interrupts a lot more in uh, the intermediate x86 class as well as the breakpoint interrupt. But basically the reason why they're, um, using the CC is they're going to be initializing memory to this. It's going to be setting a big initialization. And it's kind of like uh, for two purposes. One, if you ever read from this memory, they can say, you know, OK, you just read from something which is CC. You should have never read from that. You know, that's just my initialization value. And two, if you really screw up your program and you like, you know, some do some buffer overflow or something and you accidentally jump into this code here. So if you accidentally somehow set the inter instruction pointer to this memory which is being initialized, then uh, you're going to hit a breakpoint and it'll immediately break into the debugger and the debugger and you'll be like, why am I here right now? Why did I get a debug breakpoint? I don't have a debug breakpoint here. But it's because you messed up your code and you jumped into somewhere you shouldn't have. And so this is kind of like a catch-all uh, way of sticking a bunch of breakpoints in there so that if you accidentally screw up and go somewhere you're not supposed to, you'll get a breakpoint. And also it's to uh, initialize values so that it can check whether or not you've screwed up your stack. So that's, see that function at the end, the RTC check stack vars? Later on, it's going to go back and say, you know, we're not going to step into that function, but it's going to go back and it's going to say, you know, I set some CCs right here, and if they're not currently CCs, that means you probably buffer overflowed your stack because, as we'll see when we get into this, uh, this picture of the, the stack as it's doing this instruction, uh, 
you'll see it's kind of setting guards on either side of that buffer that we allocated so that if you ever write outside of your buffer, uh, it checks that at the end. So to be clear, this is not like a security check. This is literally just a sanity check. Um, that buffer security check that we did before is the security check. This, since it has a fixed value, uh, there's nothing particularly preventing an attacker from, you know, writing CCs. The attacker would know what he would have to write in order to make sure that he doesn't fail the sanity check, whereas the security version has a random value rather than a fixed value. But we'll talk about that later. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to start out at the top of main. Let's see, which, where do I have most stuff down? All right, start at the top of main. We have the saved return for whoever called main. All right, so saved EIP from the initialization code, which called main. First thing we do is push EBP. So now we have saved EBP. That's our first instruction, All right? Set the stack pointer equal to the frame pointer. So initially, right now we have this equals EBP after we do the move ESP to EBP, right? ESP is right here right now. And EBP. So this is right now after the, maybe I should somehow highlight where I am. i do it this way. All right, so after that instruction, that's the uh, thing that we see on the stack. So now I'm going to do the sub instruction. So sub hex 30 from ESP. And I believe hex 30 is uh, 48 bytes. And remember, we have a 40 byte buffer. We have char. Uh, whatever it was, buffer 40 bytes, right? So this thing is over allocating extra space essentially. So this is x30 equals 48 bytes. So we did ESP minus x30. So now ESP is down here. So this is ESP aka EBP minus x30. All right, so that just allocated some space for this local variable, but we can see it allocated too much space. All right, then we have push EDI. Okay, so that does, uh, that is confirming that I had my variables in the wrong version. All right, so this is, uh, Saved EDI, all right? Anyone tell me why we're pushing EDI in this case? Yep. Yep. So she said we're going to overwrite it, and we'd like to uh, make sure it doesn't get overwritten. And key point she said is we're going to pop that value later, right? So down at the bottom. This is our confirmation that EDI is a callee saved register. So it's like main right now is the callee of something else, right? Someone called main. And so main right away at the beginning is saying, look, I'm the callee, but I know I want to use EDI. And so I better not screw up EDI for the guy who called me. So I'm going to save it right away and I'm going to pop it at the end. And that's the popping at the end is why uh, the save and restore is why you know that it's some sort of caller, callee, save kind of thing going on here. All right, so push DDI. That's, we've got that on our stack below our local variables. And now we're going to do, well, and the other question is, can anyone tell me uh, why I want to use EDI right now? You know, why must I save EDI? Why do I know automatically that I'm going to destroy EDI? Yes? And that's what's being used by Stas, isn't it? Right. Yep. So we know that we're going to use a rep. Well, the compiler knows it wants to use a rep Stas instruction. And the rep Stas instruction always uses EDI as the destination for its copying, right? So it has to use EDI. It has no other choices in what registers it can use. And therefore, it needs to save it off so that it doesn't destroy it for the caller. All right, so anyways, then we're going to do an LEA of EBP minus 30 into EDI, right? So 
Right now, stack pointer is actually down here. Stack pointer moved down. So this is still pointing to e well, there's nothing pointing to this right now. This is just for my own, uh, for my own benefit. I, I noted that when we subtracted hex 30 from ESP, which was EBP at the time, this location right here happens to be EBP minus 30. And then, you know, ESP then, when we did the push, EDI, ESP got down here. All right. So, got our ESP down here. And now we have an LEA, EBP minus 30, into EDI. Right? And so remember, LEA, we're not going to memory at that location. We just want to know what's this address right here. And that is sort of, you know, the address of the bottom of whatever this space was, right? So we're just going to take this address right here. We'll, you know, we'll make up some value for it. We'll say it's going to be, you know, 12FF, you know, 20 or something. I don't know. Right? And so we're going to move that into EDI. And so we're going to say right now, essentially, EDI points here as well. I guess I didn't really need to write a fake value because we don't really care what it is. All we care is EDI right now points at the bottom of this allocation space, right? And then we, you know, again, we can see bam, 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 set EDI, set ECX, set EAX, right? Right in front of that rep stops. So we set EDI to EBP uh, minus 30 right there. We're going to set ECX to hex C. Right, so ECX equals hex C, and then we're going to set EAX to CCCC. EAX equals CCCCCC. Right. All right, so, and then now this is, you know, like I said, thus far I've been kind of not making a big deal of this, but when you want to know what form a given instruction is in Intel syntax, there is this portion in here which will frequently say, you know, D word pointer, right? So it's going to say this is going to be operating on D words four bytes at a time. So I said there's a version of RepStos where it's doing one byte at a time. That one would say byte pointer. This one says D word pointer. Therefore, it's doing four bytes at a time. So given the fact that it's doing four bytes at a time, right? What can we say about, uh, you know, where's my copy going to stop here? All right, so I'm going to copy four bytes at a time, XC times, so how many bytes am I copying? 48, yes, 12 times 4, 48. So this is 48, right? My size is essentially 48 divided by 4, right? Because I said, the ECX is just a counter of how many times you're going to do it. It doesn't care about, like, you know, whether you're incrementing by four or incrementing by one. But the compiler needs to care about that, right? So the compiler needs to know if I'm going to copy 48 bytes, four bytes at a time, I better, you know, not put in 48. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going way too far, right? So the compiler definitely knows to make sure that the sizes all line up. If I'm going to use a four byte copy, divide my size by four, right? So anyways, what's this going to do? It's going to put, you know, C, 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 all the way home. Right. All that's going to be C, C, C. When you get to the end, EDI is going to be pointing here. Well, I guess EDI will be pointing at the next thing past that because, well, I guess I don't know whether it does a post increment or pre increment on the last time. So. EDI is in quantum superposition, and it is simultaneously both there and there until I find out where it would actually be. And I guess I can do that pretty easily by just uh, stepping through this code. <clears throat> all right. So anyways, then after the rep sauce, we just saw all of that set. All right. Now we're going to see hex 2A, which happens to be 42 moved that into EBP minus 5. All right, so this is EBP. We know EBP minus 4 is like, you know, 4 bytes down right there. And then we have EBP minus 5. EBP minus 5. So, you know, I can draw this different ways, but I'm going to say that 
in the way I'm drawing this, I'll divide this up by four, right? And I'll say this is memory. So I'm going to say little end is, uh, is put first. So I'm going to be saying, you know, minus five is right here. And then minus four is right here. So that's, I'm going to call that negative four. I'm going to say, you know, this position is the actual negative four. And this position is the negative three. This position is the negative two. And that's the negative one. This is the negative five. And that's the negative six. And that's the negative seven. That's the negative eight, right? So EBP minus five, we'll say, is right here, right? And what's it doing? It's putting hex 2a into that, right? I'm going to put hex 2a into that. And what does that tell us about, you know, the actual buffer that was in our original C code, right? So back to our original C code. We had buff of 40. And we have the 39th entry, the last entry of the buffer, set to 42, right? So what that can tell us is EBP minus 5, this thing right here, is the 39, you know, the index 39 of buffer, right? So if I went, counted back the way that I'm counting, I could go all the way down to here, I believe, right? So this would be, well, so, I mean, I'm counting the opposite direction. Those were EBP minus things, right? But this is uh, this is index zero in buff. Well, all that buff of zero is down there, and that right there is buff of thirty-nine, right? But actually, the thing is here. Right, we have a 40 byte buffer, but we allocated 48 bytes, right? So there's actually four bytes on this side, and there's four bytes on this side, and then there's this 40 byte buffer in the middle here, right? So we didn't, we didn't set any of the rest of this buffer, so the rest is all defaulting to CCC right now. We only set this last element of it, right? And then we just return, right? But you can kind of see this is the way that the compiler has chosen to generate this code. It over allocated space with a space on the front and space on the well, space above and space below. And it's got CCCs above and it's got CCCs below. Sorry. Above and below. All right. So again, just going to wipe those out. This is all CCCCCCCC. And then, yes, question. So, what, what compass is that serving? Attack. Right, exactly. And that's what I said. So this is not a buffer overflow thing. This is just a sanity check thing so that when a programmer is sitting in their Visual Studio environment, when you get done with your code, so here's the thing, right? There's two byte, there's two instructions worth of real work here. There's setting buff 39 equal to 42, and then there's returning hex blood. And then everything after that is now, you can think of it like teardown, right? And you can see within that teardown is this call to this RTC, run, um, is it runtime C, function called check stack vars, right? So we might have a notion, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever actually dove into it. We could if you want, but uh, we can have the notion that this thing is going to be checking, you know, stuff on either side of this buffer. It probably only checks this one, actually because typically your buffer overflows, right? They overflow that way. So it's not worried about malicious buffer overflows that are trying to, like, gain control of the program. They're just worried about the programmer screwing something up. So if the programmer screws something up and copies too much data to their buffer for whatever reason, if there was, like, a mem copy or something like that in their code, right, then they could potentially screw up the CCC here. And then that function at the end is going to say, I know that I have at EBP minus four, I know I better have CCCC. If I don't, I'm going to prompt the uh, developer and I'm going to say, error, your stack variables are corrupted. Fix your code. Right? So that's uh, the basics of it. So actually, I'm going to step through this quick because I want to see where EDI is at the end. I don't know why I wrote ESI. Exactitude matters in assembly language. Just bad because I'm good at simple mistakes. 
All right. So this is example eight, I believe. Yep. Bam. Run it. All right. So we can see this is, you know, the unop. This is the version that has the sanity check in it. We got all of our CCCs and all that. So I'm up here. I'm going to do bam, 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 bam. And then now I said I wanted to know where EDI is going to be at the end of this, whether it's going to point. Essentially, I want to know whether it points at EBP or EBP minus four, right? So I can just step over this. Actually, let's see. If I step into, let's see if it does one at a time. Yep. So if I step into, <coughs> sorry, let's go ESP right here. I set that to refresh, right? If I step into this rep sauce, you can see CC gets copied, CC gets copied, CC gets copied, right? Right there. For each time I step into, the debugger will actually let me, you know, stop after each instance of this copy. Or I can just step over and then bam, everything gets set to CC you know, for 48 bytes. All right, and then I guess I wanted to know, does EDI point at EBP? or think past it, and yes, it does point. So EDI, even for the last, um, the last iteration, basically, I was trying to determine, for the last iteration, it still increments EDI, and then it checks ECX is equal to zero. So EDI points up here. It did, you know, 48, or it did hex C version, hex, hex C copies, but then after that, it was still, you know, four, four bytes beyond where it actually was copying. And so <coughs> now let's uh, let's kind of step into the actual uh, check function here at the end. I don't know where my symbols went today. All right, so step over, step oh, smash. Try that again. All right, so I'm at the call instruction, and so I'm going to step into this because I don't really know what it does. And then let's take a let's take a gander here. Well, I can see right there. There's a compare against CCCC, right? So it's checking something to say is it still CCCC. And there's another compare against CCCC. And then I would guess this call is probably like a call to like you failed or something like that. Print pop up a box that says like, you know, you fail. Otherwise, if you don't call that, then you probably eventually hit this return instruction, right? So, like I said, basically it looks like it's, you know, checking values to make sure that they're still equal to CCC. I guess I can uh, smash this manually and we'll see what happens here. So, <coughs> There's my 2A, right? That's my 42 that I copied into that 39th position, the 39th index into the thing. But, you know, like I said, I suspect that this CCC after the buffer is what they're looking for to make sure that, like, you didn't overflow it. So I'm going to set that to, like, something else, like zeros. All right. I'm going to step through the code and I'm going to assume it's eventually going to pop something up and say you screwed up your stack. So, just going to step over and see which branches it takes. All right, well, I did a first compare, EDI versus ESI, whatever. All right. And now here's just a, an interesting point here, right? You can have the jump less than or equal be uh, displaced from the compare, right? And this is where, you know, you may ask yourself, okay, well, did these move instructions set any flags that this thing compares, uh, cares about? I'm going to say probably not, even though this is displaced. Uh, if, if this jump was based on these move instructions, which were immediately before it, right, then there would be no point to be doing a compare anyways, right? So, you know, my in intuition here says it's really this compare back a couple of instructions ago which is what the jump is actually uh, jumping based on. And this is, again, one of those cases where 
you know, I could go try to find the flags and uh, there is a flags thing right here, but I definitely don't recommend using this because Microsoft decided to go with their own names for flags. So it's OV instead of the overflow flag OF, which is what it should be. It's OV and up equals zero. Up is the direction flag. They're saying the direction flag is currently set to zero, therefore it's up. And if I change the direction flag to one, it would say DN or something down. So whatever, the flags are ridiculous here. I typically don't use this at all. If I really have to have flags here, you got your e-flags register there. I go back to the manual and I say which bit position is the flag that I care about. And I compare that against this X202, whatever. So anyways, like I say, normally I don't care what the flags are. I just go ahead and jump over it and see what it says. Okay, well, whatever. Didn't take that jump. Fine. Now I just did a compare. Okay, well, here I maybe want to see, like, what this is, right? Uh, so ECX plus EBX minus 4, and it's comparing that against CC. It's not uh, giving it to me with mouse over, but I'm going to try like this. Well, what I'd do here is maybe uh, open up another memory window. Like so. Paste that in. Press return. Okay, well, this thing that it's comparing against right now, memory is currently CCC for this ECX plus EBX minus 4. So, you know, this compare is going to be, uh, you know, something with itself. Compare instruction is a subtract. Subtract something from itself. It's going to set the zero flag because the result is going to be zero. And so it's saying jump if not equal, jump if not zero. And therefore, we don't expect this is going to actually take the jump. And indeed, it fell through to the next instruction. But now this one is where I think it'll probably fail. Do. All right, so EDX plus EBX. Let's see it's at, what's that memory there. Okay, that's my zeros, right? That's uh, what I put in manually. And if I go up, right, there's the 2A. And there's my zeros. So it checked the buffer on one side, and now it's checking the buffer on the other side. It's going to fail on this. So I expect it's going to, uh, this will be equal, this will, uh, these will not be the same thing. So the zero flag will not be set. And so this uh, jump equal will not be taken, I believe. Right, so it fell through, but now I fell through to what? Well, I said that call is probably the call to prompt the developer that you fail. Right, so let's go ahead and step over it. Oh, it didn't give me a nice little, like, oh well. I was hoping it would give me a dialog box. Do, 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 do. Well, I'm just going to get out of here. And maybe it'll prompt me later. Maybe that call just like set something somewhere that'll prompt me later. All right. Maybe on the return. Nope. Tough luck. Oh, but I smashed my stack. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know. Later on, you can go make your own example where you have a mem copy and just like copy way too much data. And I'm sure you'll see like a little prompt telling you you messed up. All right, anyways, that was RepStos. So, and then, okay, returning to that uh, direction flag thing that I said, <coughs> you know, a couple of people found, potentially. <coughs> Here's the interesting thing about the direction flag. By default, typically, the direction flag is zero. When direction flag is zero, that means copy upwards from low to high. <clears throat> if the direction flag is manually set to one, for instance, that means now these repeat instructions, which would normally <coughs> increment EDI by four, So whereas we said that the normal operation of these rep instructions is you increment EDI by the size of whatever you're copying each time, if you change the direction flag, it'll actually decrement EDI by the size of what you're copying each time. So you can have sort of a reverse copy where it copies from low to high. You know, so I could have like set EDI up here and then I could have set the direction flag to one and then it would have copied that direction. And the funny thing about this is um, if I mean, I don't know if this is exploitable in any cases. Maybe, maybe not. But typically, the compiler to 
if the compiler is being good about things, it would, for instance, clear the direction flag immediately before the rep stos instruction. Because it would say, like, look, I know that this instruction sequence I've generated is going to target here and it, I want it to go positive, right? If, you know, the guy before uh, main was called, if that set the direction flag equal to one, then that would totally screw up this copy and it would copy in the wrong direction, basically. Uh, so potentially, <coughs> potentially that could screw with stuff. Maybe, maybe not. Probably not in most cases, but you can probably induce some weird bugs by flipping the direction flag around, right? So maybe it's a small copy, right? Maybe instead of being like something where you're trying to smash a huge thing, maybe you've got buffer here and maybe it's just a struct or something like that and you've got struct here and then, you know, so struct is here, struct is here and the thing thinks it's going to be copying from some other struct like off in some point or somewhere to that struct right now but instead you flip to the direction flag somewhere and now it copied onto that struct except now it's in backwards order so that could potentially mess with you but, uh, but you could be like smashing other local variables here, right? We had only one local variable in this case but, you know, your local variables are generally contiguous, right? And so if you have something which is doing a repeated copy over here, if you change the directions, you're potentially messing with other local data variables. And <coughs> there is um, work out there that suggests that as opposed to your traditional buffer overflow where you're uh, trying to go after that saved EIP in order to, like, control the instruction pointer, there is, um, there was, like, a paper, I don't remember when, 2005 maybe, called um, non-control flow data attacks are realistic. It was like out of Microsoft research. And they basically said like, look, in some cases where you're buffer overflowing and you're just overflowing into adjacent data, you're not like smashing the stack and destroying the EIP that's saved. In some cases, if you're just buffer overflowing into adjacent data local variables, you're changing a local variable and then that changes the control of the thing because, you know, there's some check that says if a equals whatever, right? And you've changed A to now not equal something and therefore you're diverging the control flow path. So uh, smashing local variables and stuff like that is uh, a potential exploit path, but it, uh, it's not the generic exploit path that smashing EIP is. So it's more of like an application specific kind of attack that you would have to do. So anyways, that's the direction flag and its pertinence to uh, RepStos. <clears throat> any questions? Anyone on the phone have any questions? All right. So we're going to go on to the next uh, example. <clears throat> All right. And oh, just as a pointing out, um, where this came from is like I left the. Um, basic runtime checks in Visual Studio, right? This is the thing where I told you to set it to default so that we turn off these two types of checks. One of them is stack frames, where it's, it's checking to make sure you haven't, you know, messed with your stack frame. And the other one is the uninitialized variable. So if you create A and then you read from A before you've set anything into A, then it'll prompt you and say you've tried to access an uninitialized variable. And so again, if you turn off those uh, sanity check, uh, basic runtime checks option, then you'll just get this code, which is very simple, standard, standard stack frame setup, allocation of space for your local, setting the last element of the local, which is now EBP minus one, right, because it bumps up directly against that saved EIP because you don't have that forced padding in between it. And then uh, set EAX equal to blood and tear it down. <coughs> 